this hang wall and the material, and it will lead to something known as a blevy, a boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion. So as the pressure increases, the tank metal weakens, and sooner or later, the increased pressure will rupture the wall of the tank, and we will have a massive vapor release and fireball. One of the other things that we'll discuss in the training is odorization. You can see an odorization unit there on the right hand side of the screen. Natural gas and LPG don't have a, a, a natural sense of smell, a natural smell. So we have to add the odor. And we either use ethamacaptan or dimethyl sulfide. And we have to add that depending on the country's limits, but in the UK, it has to be detectable at 20% of the lower explosive limit. So if we've got 20% of 2%, 2% being the lower explosive limit of propane, we have to be able to smell the fuel when we've got 0.4% fuel in air. There's a little bit more information there on the slide that says that as an LPG tank starts to reduce in volume, the smell of gas will become stronger. And that's because the stenching agent stays in the vessel until the very end because of its own vaporization properties. So we tend to, get that, tend to find that customers report gas escapes that may have been occurring for a while, but they tend to report them when the vessel becomes near empty because the smell of gas becomes stronger. So that was just uh, an overview of the uh, utilization of LPG and the, in the UK, how we look at registration and competence, and just a little bit about an introduction to some of the things that we will cover in future events in terms of training, and thank you for your time. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Johnston. Uh, very quickly, let's move on to Felix. Felix Ekundayo, before we'll, we ask um, Titi Lola to do his or her presentation, rather. So Felix will now um, take over the screen and give us his presentation, uh, talking about the gas-based economy success stories, Saudi Arabia and Qatar case studies. Okay, I think you switched the order, but that's fine. Yes, I did. Uh, good, <laughs> good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, okay, I'll run through, I thought I would speak about the um, macro level. Okay, what makes gas-based industrialization concepts work in other regions, okay? So I'll run through uh, my own experience. What are the issues with Nigeria's gas complexes, even if we start with that? So I'll read these very quickly. Gas complexes in the guise of free trade zones are popping up everywhere in Nigeria. Lagos, Lagos alone had four. This presentation is actually about 16 years old, if you would believe it or not. Um, however, anticipated growth in industrial activity has not materialized. The promoters of these zones are not at fault. They're simply forced to be too many things at the same time. Okay. So okay, Felix, are you going to share your screen to us so we can see it? Oh, am I not doing that? No, you're not. Uh, my apologies. Okay, I'll start again now. Can you see my screen now? Yes, we can see your screen. Yeah, there you okay. go. Thank you. Oh, thanks for stopping me on time. Okay, so the issues with uh, Nigeria's gas complexes, as I was saying, um, Lagos alone has four. The promoters of the zones are usually forced to be too many things. They're forced to be, uh, here we go, promoter, developer, industry investor, and regulator. And it really is a tough challenge to meet. So what, let's discuss what are the clear, success requires a clear view on development strategy. So, give you an idea. Algeria used to be known as the gas kingdom at one point in time. So it had a lot of gas prior to uh, Saudi Arabia discovering large quantities of gas. So Algeria was ticking along. They started off, I think, probably one of the first LNG plants uh, in the world. Um, Saudi Arabia started picking up quite a lot of gas. And in anticipation of that, the king of Saudi Arabia at the time, King Fahd, said, look, he wants to monetize this product that they were otherwise flaring. 
he saw value in it and he decided to find a way to develop uh, an industrial complex to monetize the gas. So what are the key drivers for gas complexes? Because of time, I'm going to abridge it to just the red lines. Economic engines for growth, they are drivers of employment and they develop local content. That's, those are the three primary uh, reasons why anybody would want to say, okay, we'll put this much money into infrastructure. Okay, so how did they do it? There are two examples I want to talk about today. For Jubail, I was a project member, and in Rasla Fine, I was a, the deputy project manager for the master plan. In Jubail, okay, so this is where Jubail is, and this is where Rasla Fane is in Qatar. Okay, and we'll take a look if time permits. So in Jubail, okay, basically an assessment was done. So this is a, a screenshot of the model at the time. An assessment was done, gas-based industries, you choose what industry you want, the capacity, the uh, comparison to world scale. So if you choose 2000 world scale, the limit being the biggest size in the world at that time. World scale, uh, the amount of land it required when you were going to start it, and a bunch of other parameters. When you do that with the model, what you then do is you are able to generate comparisons between Jubel and other competitive uh, master plan or master planned industrial uh, zones. So you're looking at Houston, you're looking at Singapore, Raslafan, uh, Jebel Ali. Um, so having considered each type of industry, whether it's styrene, whether it's methanol, whether it's ethylene, the government will now decide, okay, this is the timing of what we think will come up. Let's develop infrastructure to cater for all of these facilities. What does each type of facility require? So that when the facility comes, they don't need to build anything outside the expertise. In Nigeria, we have the concept of BYOI, right? Bring your own infrastructure, which means you have to do everything, power, sewage, uh, water, security, everything. The concept here was to remove everything that is not core expertise to you and leave that with the industrial city. You therefore only come with what you know how to do, which is how to build a methanol plant or a styrene plant or ethylene cracker, whatever it may be, okay? So Jubail, very quick, 1975, started by, uh, um, initiated by King Fahd, 10,000 hectare facility. Uh, it was called Jubail Park East. Um, and they had an, urban area, two major ports associated with it. Uh, by, 20, by 2005, it had 25 primary industries, 40 secondary industries, and several tertiary industries. So the primary industries would be the, the transformative industries, your refineries, your petrochemical plants, and so on. Secondary industries take from the primary industry and they create products for local markets or for exports, so plastics uh, and so on. Tertiary industries service these other two. So these ones are the ones that, that employ people. Uh, this is where you train people with, for, for skills and so on to service these industries. By uh, 1999, Jubail Park East was getting full. So they decided to establish a new park called Park West, Jubail Park West. And this is what we worked on. As of 2005, Jubail and Yambu, Yambu is the other sister facility uh, in Saudi Arabia were contributing from a low of about 3%. They were contributing about 30%. Today, I think they are over 20% of Saudi GDP. So this is the entire complex of Jubail. Urban area, Jubail Park East, Jubail Park West, and an airport, plus King Fahd Industrial Port and King Fahd Commercial Port. We had nothing to do with this. This is what we were interested in. This little bit here is 13 kilometers long into the sea, and that was all artificial um, uh, development. Okay, so this is what Jubail looked like in 2003. Massive complexes, refineries, whatnot, uh, gas processing plants, each one producing a product that was eventually going to be transformed in the economy. These are cooling channels. Each one of these channels is, I think if I remember right, about 100 meters long, I, it is, sorry, wide, not long. It is wider than an Olympic swimming pool is long. And the whole purpose of all of these channels was to carry cooling water into the industries and warm water out from the industries so that they could produce. Park East looked a little bit like this. It was planned for stage development, stage one, 
stage two, stage three, stage four. And each one of these plots was serviced with electricity, sewage, roads, uh, power, uh, name it, it, it had it, okay? The development then goes to say, okay, look, you want to do a stage-wise development to minimize cost and attract early cash flow. So the, the early industries here would probably produce feedstock for these industries that will come later and these industries and so on. So that was the plan. This is what the industrial port looked like, the export facility. As they were reaching capacity on Park East, they were developing associated infrastructure. We planned for them to develop associated infrastructure so that jet jetties, berths, and so on were going to be available. By projection of 2034, this was supposed to be filled. Again, you will see this structure later on uh, um, in a Google uh, map display. Ras Lafan, very much the same. Qatar's North Field is the biggest in the world, as some of you know. Production then was 4.3 billion cubic feet per day. The purpose of the master plan was to transform this infrastructure. So Ras Lafan master plan covered 2004 to 2024. The base case was for 30 BCF per day. The uh, planning case was 35, just in case. So basically, they were going to go from 4.3 BCF to 35. Nigeria today still produces less than this uh, value, okay? Five-year outlook, LNG trains that were supposed to come up, most of them have come, come up, okay? These were planned developments, which are mostly uh, uh, now developed. 10-year outlook, the next series of uh, developments, 20-year uh, outlook, okay? And each one of these had some kind of interrelationship with the development plan. It also covered, okay, so this is the development plan, okay? It also covered, we plan down to every detail in a master plan. What happens where you have the eventuality of a blevy? I won't go through the details of the blevy. Steve, Steve's uh, already spoken to you about blevies. So a blevy in this facility that was meant to ha house LPG, what would happen? That's the blast radius with different concentrations of radiation effects. What happens if you have a hydrogen sulfide leak in the pipeline? Uh, right of way. What happens if you have a chlorine release? The impact was a lot greater because chlorine is actually quite, um, uh, uh, how should we say, uh, dangerous. Um, what happens if you have an ammonia release? Even worse. So all of these things affected where you would keep the storage facilities for each type of uh, product. Now it comes to, okay, what do we need to do as a, as a government? What do we need to do as, a, as an industry, as a ministry that wants to develop these facilities? Um, basically, this is what the um, concrete development plan looked like or requirements were. This is what the shipping traffic would look like. Initial ships will be bringing in cargo. Uh, later ships will be exporting uh, product. Uh, steel requirements, what you need during the building phase of the, of the various projects. Um, truck traffic, you have to plan how trucks come in with construction traffic, how trucks leave with, with uh, uh, employees in the evening, things like that. Ras Lafan infra infrastructure development to support the prospective industries and material movement. The original Ras, Laf Ras Lafan uh, jetties looked like this. This was the port that was built. It was built in this way because the cooling water system filtered into this Basin. You might think this is small, but it's almost again about 10 kilometers into the sea. And the uh, Emir of Qatar at the time had stipulated that by the time water exited this point, he didn't want the Gulf waters to have gone up by more than 0.3 degrees C. So it dictated the size of the basin. Now, if you're going to, to expand the infrastructure and the number of um, uh, industries, that basin is no longer big enough, number one. Plus, you need more berths, more jetties for ships to come. So a bigger port, right, that's the old port. A bigger port was built around the old port, an artificial port. And again, you will see that later. Right, keys to success. Conceptualize your plan, okay? Design in every detail, as you've seen, okay? Layout developments, plan material movements, plan for evolution of markets, typically over 20 years and so on. And you promote, promote, promote because you are in competition with other locations that are possibly easier to work in. Somebody might, uh, staff, employees, expertise might prefer to be in the US Gulf Coast, for example. 
than to some other locations that we might have. Therefore, you have to provide reasons for those investors to relocate to Nigeria. Where are both countries today? If you will permit me, if I can do it quickly, I will go to this. Um, do Jubail. Let's see if I can get there very quickly. Can you still see my screen? Yes, we Hello? can. Okay, good. Yes, we can. So the refresh rate is a bit slow, but after this, I think we should be able to see it. So, as I said to you before, that's the that's what the port looks like um, today. That's Park East. That's Park West. Some industries developed and quite a lot of large industries here. And we're still, what, now we're 2020. So still plenty of capacity right through to 2030, 2033, right? All of this is developed. And as I mentioned to you, what you saw in design now exists in reality. To give you an idea, all of this is essentially, uh, one quick second. That's 10 kilometers straight out into the sea. Okay, um, I can show you Rasafan, but I believe that my time may be up. Let's see if I can get there quickly. Right, there we go. Let's rest the fan down there. The old port, Rasla Fan. To look at it today, you wouldn't know. That's a big, bigger port. And this is now the massive cooling basin for all these industries here. So, how do you succeed in this business? If you are competing with countries like Saudi Arabia and uh, Qatar, this is what you have to do. Okay. Wow. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, Felix. I must while you were sharing, uh, I must while you were sharing, someone from uh, someone who worked or who works for Sabic in Saudi Arabia uh, was commending your presentation and confirming what you were sharing. Ah. Uh, most <laughs> yes. For sure he wasn't paid to do I'm also, <laughs> I'm also aware that Nigeria had a plan, a gas, um, I think it was called Gas Revitalization Industrial Park. It was supposed to be somewhere close to Wari um, that was scuttled in the last couple of years for some unfortunate reasons uh, relating to ethnic uh, tensions and um, uh, rivalry between government agencies. but. That's the story uh, for another day. Uh, very quickly, I'd like to have Titi uh, make her presentation. Um, she is going to be talking about uh, LPG supply and safety uh, from the perspective of NAP gas. So Titi, we can see your screen. Uh, you may go ahead and start your presentation. Hopefully we'd like to see your face as well, if we can. Uh, show us your video. Thank you, Falabi. Unfortunately, I can't show my face because I'm having challenges with the bandwidth. So I'll just talk through the presentation. I hope you don't mind. That's fine. Go ahead. Okay, so um, Mr. Yakubu was kind enough to talk about what's been happening in the domestic LPG market over the past couple of years. So I'll take it up from where he started. And he spoke about LLNG and the intervention that he did in 2017. Now, it's been a very, very impressive growth market since that period. Um, when the intervention took hold in 2007, we only had about 16,500 capacity as at 2010. Today, we have over 60,000 metric tons active capacity coming on board this year. At the time we started operations in Navgas in 2010, we had less than 150 trucks registered. Now we have over 1,200. When we started operations in 2010, we had less than 200 active 
LPG plants. Now we have over 670 registered with DPR nationwide. And exciting developments in terms of manufacturing. We have Techno, Techno um, commissioned their facility last year, which can produce 5 million cylinders per annum. And One Gas and the Nigerian Content and Development Monitoring Board also building a facility in Bayel so that will be able to do 400,000 um, 400, cylinders per annum. So it's been growing at a very impressive rate. From 2007 to now, we've had over 1,100% one, 1, growth. This has been driven mostly by the private sector. And now the government is looking at staging an intervention that will take this um, consumption to about 5,000 metric tons per annum. Now this uh, 5,000 metric tons per annum is not just looking at cooking gas, which is co uh, currently the main driver in the Nigerian market, but also looking at other applications of LPG, um, auto gas, industrial applications, and gas to power. So really the question is, where is the opportunity? And that's the question that I'd like to answer. The government in 2019 indicated that they would like to have an energy switch to LPG, 40% energy switch. They're looking at switching from petrol, kerosene, and diesel to LPG over a 10-year period. Now, what's excited about this? We're now talking about gas-based economy and how we can move industrialization forward in Nigeria. One of the main problems and challenges we have is power. Um, Nigeria currently has about 12.5 megawatts of installed capacity for power generation but usually what's actually delivered is less than one third of that where the our energy demands is very underutilized that we're not getting the supply that's required um, Ghana produces twice as much Tunisia 10 times as much and um, South Africa 30 times as much right now most of the power generation in the country up to 40, 14 gigawatts is actually done by small-scale diesel and petrol generators now this is very challenging and that's why we're now talking about what can we do. We have a real supply of LPG. Right now Nigeria is currently faring an estimated 1.5 to 2.5 million tons of LPG that is not recovered from flared gas. Um, this opens up an opportunity because with what we're faring we can actually generate 1,000 megawatts of electricity. Now this is being done in other African countries. For example, in Ghana, they're currently, they currently have a project called the Bridge Power Plants, which will be delivered this year. Um, I'm not sure how COVID-19 has affected it, but it's meant to be delivered this year. And it's going to be the largest power plant of its kind fueled by LPG in the world. Now, LPG is probably going to be a bridge or a parallel fuel to natural gas in the power sector because small players can use it and big power plants are also using it currently. So LPG is less, is easier and less expensive to compress, ship and store. Uh, you can use it to power uh, local power plants. You can use it in combination with wind, solar and hydro and other renewable sources. Um, and it's also cost efficient, it's cleaner. Nigeria signed the Paris Climate Agreement in 2018 and LPG is one of the things that we can do to reduce uh, the green gas emissions in the country. So this is probably where the opportunity exists in LPG, specifically propane at this time. Um, I want to share one of the projects that's been done by a sister company of Navgas. This is um, a facility in the Virgin Islands called IPOS. They, they switched seven of the existing gas turbines to use propane as a primary fuel source. As well. So the question is, why would people want to switch to propane? Yes, it's going to be good for the environment. And yes, it makes sense because we have competitive from 2012 to 2019 you can see that the price has been constantly falling so the pricing is attractive and we expect that as the supply gets more so the prices will also begin to drop so it's very attractive and you have good supply u.s fracking has generated reliable long-term supply so this is also beneficial to switch into this as an alternative for the power generation um, most people in nigeria industries um, use diesel generators. So it's a good thing to compare propane and diesel so that we have an idea 
of what the pricing is like. So not only is the price of propane dropping, but when you look at it, you can see that propane has, over the past six years, been cheaper than diesel. Propane is cheaper, it's more efficient, it's cleaner. Um, it doesn't need to be refined, it's a byproduct. Uh, the, the, OPEX is lower than operating diesel. And when you're talking about your generators, you don't, you don't need as much maintenance. So it is um, a very attractive proposition for the energy markets. Um, right now, we are seeing a lot of OEMs coming to the Nigeria market. Uh, we held a propane exhibition, a propane to power exhibition in January. And we had stakeholders from across board, from, um, churches, schools, a lot of people generating interest, um, service providers, telecom communication companies trying to use for their uh, mass, for their power mass to run on propane generators. So the main question is that what do we need to have in place to be able to harness this market? And we're now looking at what the government is doing in terms of regulations, because the government wants to ensure that people that are coming in are going to do it safe and that the practices are going to be the best so that you don't have um, incidents <clears throat> in the market. So right now we're trying to build a case for safe operations of propane, um, looking at how the government can put in place um, enabling environment for people to bring in import propane generators and propane accessories that would help us harness this market. It's also good to mention that one of the good things about propane also is that there can also be a switch in terms of instead of spending Forex importing diesel, we can actually have a switch because we can get the propane locally available. So that's just taking you through the presentation and thank you. Thank you very much, Ditila. That, that was a very, very interesting uh, presentation. In fact, all of our, um, sorry, Titilola, all of our panelists have uh, presented very well. Um, before we go to the Q&A session, very quickly, I'd like to take a couple of poll questions, and my colleague David will be assisting with this. Uh, the very first question is, uh, what are your thoughts about the barriers to gas development in Nigeria? And would like all of our participants to very quickly attend to this uh, poll. And then the second one, we might as well do it together, is if you were interested in investing in an LPG business in Nigeria, what challenge would you want the government to address? So please go ahead and uh, answer those two questions very quickly. Okay, just to go, I'll go on quickly. Okay, uh, let me check on the one in terms of the barriers, uh, Mr. Apolabi. Uh, the okay. Nigerian gas industry at the moment uh, has uh, a limited uh, kind of regulatory framework. It's not clear. Uh, and uh, mind you, when people are investing a lot of money into uh, a gas business, they want to really be certain in terms of profitability, sustainability, and how, how long it will last. So if uh, one of the barriers, as far as I believe is, if the frameworks are becoming clearer, which gradually they are becoming now with network code in place, and we are, at the stage of market development. So I'm afraid we cannot get all the information on one day, but as we move on gradually, it, uh, frameworks will be much more clearer and people will be able to make a wiser uh, and commitment in terms of investment. So uh, frameworks are the major issues in terms of my understanding. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Abbas. Uh, David, do you have the results of the poll? Can you share with us? Um, yes, although it seems like a lot of people are still um, trying to trying to answer the poll, right? But um, let me just go, quickly go through. Um, so the first question that says, what do you think is the biggest barrier to gas development in Nigeria? 42% um, said it's lack of infrastructure. 40% um, said lack of clear regulatory frameworks. 11% um, said lack of awareness. And 4% said safety-related issues. Right. Okay. And then for the second question, which is if you were interested in investing in an LPG business in Nigeria, 
what challenges, what challenge would you want the government to address? Um, 48% said legislative frameworks, 27% um, said project financing, 19% said market uncertainty, and 8% said knowledge gap. Okay, great. Thank you very much uh, to our participants for uh, that feedback. Very quickly, uh, before we go into the questions, I'd like to ask the Executive Secretary of uh, the NLPGA, uh, to share one or two pieces of information with us. And David is presenting the, as you can see on your screen, the results of the poll. Majority of people in the first question feel lack of infrastructure is the biggest barrier to development in Nigeria. And on the second question, most of you uh, would rather see government tackle the issue of legislative frameworks as 45%. Thank you very much, David, for that. So, Mr. Oyebanjo, the Executive Secretary of NLPG A, would share one or two pieces of information with us relating to the kind of training that's available. Mr. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, just trying to share my screen. Yeah, please do. Are we seeing that? On behalf of um, ETC, Energy Center and the Nigeria Topic Association. I would want to um, appreciate one of you for joining this webinar. And quickly, just want to let you know that um, uh, the Nigerian Topic Association has a very robust uh, training program in the training faculty. I want to share you, um, share with you the various uh, courses that are available. Uh, to be delivered actually uh, we have a PG, trying to know the basics about the product uh, introduction to gases in terms of understanding what pressure temperature uh, volume concentration and all that has to do with um, uh, effective uh, uh, effective businesses using gas and also LPG facility safety uh, and audit checklist uh, what owners can do to determine that their their facilities are, and operators are in line with what they should be doing in terms of safety uh, is a good checklist that has been launched in our uh, national conference international conference last year and uh, uh, we have a training that can help everyone get to get up to speed about what they are trying to do with their facilities and then we have training for management and uh, owners on gas and gas uh, fiscal accounting, how you can prevent losses uh, across the value chain from, from the point of uh, uh, loading to the point of uh, offloading. It's important to know how you can prevent losses and the uh, wastages and the uh, uh, problems that are occasioned by a lot of um, uh, activities along that chain. So these trainings are available online, uh, be delivered online. And so if you want us to uh, do this for you, please, you can contact us based on the information you can see on the screen right now. Uh, our telephone number has, has shown, and our email address also. Has, uh, our social media uh, details are also indicated on the screen, as well as uh, our physical address. Thank you very much once again. Uh, we'll Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Mr. Ibanjo. We'll now very quickly move into the Q&A session. We'll take uh, some of the questions. Uh, we'll come back later and talk a little bit more about training. So our first question um, is from Eniola Ola Oluwa Bukumi. Says, thank you for this enlightening service. Can I get copies of the presentations? Of course you will, you'll get copies of the presentations. 
Uh, Egwonu says yeah, the same thing about copies of the presentation um, from Mubarak. He says, as we're looking into energy transition, what should we be looking at for the source of producing the LPG? Is there any plan going on? Can I ask um, Mr. Yakubu to answer that? Again, he says, as we're looking into energy transition, what should we be looking at for the source of producing the LPG? Is there any plan going on? Yeah, thank you. Um, practical steps to growing LPG in Nigeria will be uh, the first uh, win. Will be by the way. I hope we got uh, my audio was uh, was good because uh, I had problems with my bandwidth as well. Right? So I wasn't sure if you guys were hearing my presentation. But yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you clearly. Now, um, to, to grow market uh, will be cylinder penetration, uh, cylinder proliferation. If you put cylinders in the hands of Nigerians. Uh, two million cylinders uh, will generate uh, uh, LPG uh, trade of over 350,000 metric tons per annum. Just two million cylinders of uh, 6.5 kg. Uh, two million cylinders we give, uh, we inject, um, we grow the market by at least another 300 to 350,000 metric tons. So that's to tell you how important um, a cylinder will be. And the cylinder gap in Nigeria is so huge. We have over 52 million homes in Nigeria, and we have a cylinder population of. Uh, uh, three to five million. So there's a, such a huge demand gap. So if we were to even inject 10 million cylinders, then we all have enough uh, uh, volume of LPG to trade uh, uh, in, in country. And then also uh, another very important stimulus would be um, autogas. Um, uh, Nigeria is a net exporter of LPG and we import petrol. Why don't we, I think it makes, uh, it makes common sense that uh, we switch over to the fuel that we can produce locally. Uh, this, there's so much pressure exerted on Nigerian Naira, downward pressure exerted on Nigerian Naira compared as the exchange with international currencies, largely driven by um, uh, uh, demand for Forex for importation of petroleum products. The major driver, the key driver for Forex demand in Nigeria is importation of petroleum products. So if we were to switch over to the locally produced uh, fuel like LPG, which is a broad spectrum fuel for put bar power generation for auto gas, that will actually reduce the pressure on the Naira and then we stabilize our Naira to allow for proper planning for infrastructure builder. So I would say easily uh, cylinder uh, injection, one, number two, auto gas uh, and industrial gas uh, application will be to, the way to go and grow the, 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 the market. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Abbas, would you be able to answer this question uh, about getting copies of the presentations? Could you please uh, answer that quickly? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Apolabi. Uh, the uh, assumption I have is uh, the participants have access to the video, and that is easier way of getting the slides. Am I right? Yes. Yes, you are. But uh, if there is any consensus among all the panelists, I'm very happy to, to, to agree on whatever the panelists want us to, to, to do. It's absolutely- Dr. Fine. Abbas, you're right. We, we are providing the uh, recording of the video to participants who attended the conference, I mean, the masterclass. Okay. So I mentioned that at the beginning of the, the class. That is absolutely fine. Thank you very much. We'll do that then. Okay. All right. So this next question, does NLPGA play any role in facilitation of investment in the sector, especially from Nigerians in diaspora? Well, uh, I'll say NLP, the, the, to the extent that we engage um, regulators, re engage the federal government, uh, we do play a role. Uh, for example, it is our active uh, involvement in discussions and uh, engagement to federal government that allowed for the removal of VAT on LPG. So now, just like any other uh, down uh, uh, refined petroleum product, LPG no longer attracts VAT uh, when you trade it. Also, we have managed to uh, secure um, uh, duty import duty waivers for LPG equipment. There's no better time than now to uh, build out uh, your LPG, your LPG a plant if you had such plants any LPG infrastructure because the federal government has waived uh, duty 
on all FPG equipment importation in, in, into Nigeria, including spares. So that will shave off at least 30 to 35% of your project costs if you were to take advantage of this five-year window that the federal government has availed. Uh, other than that, uh, our membership uh, uh, of NLPGA cuts across the entire value chain where you have uh, consultants, as you heard Mr. Akunda spoke, ele spoke eloquently about the industrial park projects. Uh, we have membership cutting across the entire value chain where uh, uh, investors can tap into uh, knowledge uh, and to promote any project they want to promote in the country. Thank you. Thank you very much to Mr. Felix or Engineer Felix. Can you share with us the level of investment by Saudi and Qatari governments in the development of their industrial parks? Uh, hi, I saw the question earlier. I thought, okay, we'll leave it to answer here. It was in the uh, multi billions of dollars, as you can imagine. It was probably at the time uh, the original investment in Jubail Park West was about $5 billion. The investments that went into Park East, probably similar. Um, the investment into Ras Lafan was a bit more than that. Um, however, we don't need to compete with uh, those countries. We could effectively have our own, uh, um, uh, how should we say, tailored uh, approach. Those countries have, uh, we have something those countries don't have. Uh, their populations aren't large, so they had to export. We actually have a resident population that could consume a lot of what we um, uh, uh, we produced here. So the investment could be tailored very differently. Um, but if you ask directly what they spend, it's upwards of five to ten billion billion dollars. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we'll take uh, just two more questions. Um, this question from. Uh, Olatiko, it says, if the price of crude oil declined significantly in the last few weeks, what are the reasons the price of LP, the price of LPG remained the same in Nigeria since the price of gas is dependent on oil price? Uh, Dr. Abbas, would you take that? Okay. Uh, in, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Apolabi. In reality, in an actual liberal market, such as what we currently have in the UK, uh, every time oil price drop, even by uh, uh, one pence, two pence, you see prices of petrol, diesel, uh, LPG changing on daily or even on second basis. However, because Nigeria is undergoing a market development process, the market is not fully uh, uh, integrated. It has a bit of disconnection. So there is uh, some sort of uh, uh, time delay for uh, PPRA to actually recalibrate or recalculate the price. And that is possibly why it is not getting uh, changed very regularly. And that is what the network code is actually trying to show. So that at a certain point, gas trading, uh, LPG trading, and other forms of uh, trading is done online. You will be able to see if price of oil drops today, you see that the gas price will equally drop for the uh, uh, oil index contract. So similarly, other types of things. We are getting there. Hopefully in air or two, we should be able to, to have that kind of platform. Okay, can thank I, you. Can I intervene, Mr. Falabi? I think uh, it's yes, important that yes. I intervene here. Actually, yes, we, the price of FPG in Nigeria has been, has been very uh, stable, okay? If not, that it's even dropping. Uh, consider that price of LPG has been has remained the same in the last 10 years. For every of us who are in this chat room, tell me how much you've been buying 12.5 kg uh, cylinder is uh, of, of gas. It's uh, uh, averaging 2,500 to 3,000 naira plus. Since 10 years ago, when US dollar was 150 naira to a dollar, till now that US dollar is trading what 400 naira to a dollar. All right, and don't forget that we trade we, we trade LPG in Nigeria. The source price for LPG in Nigeria is, is priced in US dollars. So in spite of it that Naira has been losing value against the dollar, all right, the price of LPG has remained the same, which means technically had the price of, had the exchange rate of Naira dollar been constant in the last 10 years, you will have seen uh, a tenfold drop in the price of LPG. That's my, um, that's my response. Okay, thank you. Um, this last question is going to Titi, uh, if she's still with us. 
and her network is good. Titi, what are main impediments to gas to power framework in Nigeria and what are the solutions to these issues? And what are the stakeholders doing in this regard? Titi Lola, are you there? Are you still there? Can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Okay, right now for the gas to power, talking about propane, what we need right now is for, um, we don't have the equipment. So we need to bring in this LPG generators, bulk storage for propane, you know, the vaporizers. We also need the government to actually introduce the appropriate fiscal um, incentives to encourage investors to choose LPG over other forms of fuels. Okay, thank you. Unfortunately, we're gonna have to bring it to a close here we have so many more questions than that we cannot answer on air uh, what we will do is <clears throat> continue to engage all of our participants all of the questions we have your name and we will respond to them uh, in collaboration with all of our guest panelists and NLPGA uh, I'd like to at this point uh, thank all of our panelists uh, for their knowledge sharing for a wonderful presentation and what uh, they've been able to pass across. I also want to thank our participants uh, from this webinar. We had quite a number of people from outside Nigeria as well. I would like to ask you to please watch out for more information by following our social media handles on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And that is at etc underscore connect. And for NLPGA, their social media handle on Twitter and Instagram is at NLPGA. On LinkedIn, ETC is at ETC-NG. And our website address is www.etc.ng. The uh, NLPGA website is NigeriaLPGas.com. Um, please would like to ask you to fill the feedback forms. We would like to hear from you. Um, you would like to know the kinds of information you would like for us to bring to you as we partner with NLPGA and our, our guest panelists from the UK to bring you more of this type of masterclasses, but this time it would be paid. And you can tell that the information that will be shared is, would, is very enlightening and informative. Thank you all for being with us and we would bring it to a close at this point and would like to say goodbye and have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much, Mr. Davidson. It was a uh, good you. session. Uh, I'm sure our, our audience enjoyed it. Thank you, thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you, bye -bye. Thank you Mr. Falabi. Thank you, bye-bye. We'll